openness. This is Arnold Manjoli for Grateful, Ready, Open, Willing. And open makes me think of just open arms, just an embrace, just receiving. It makes me think of the opening of The Wizard of Oz, the uh, the early scene after Dorothy lands in Munchkin Land and the, the little munchkins and their little flowers sing about open, ah, open, ah, open, 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 ah. It's a good feeling. Openness is a really good feeling. Open minds, open hearts, open souls, openness. Are we open to what will come next? Are we open to what new forms our industry will take that remain to be seen? Are we ready to go with it? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines openness as a lack of restriction, accessibility, an acceptance of or receptiveness to change or new ideas, a lack of secrecy or concealment, frankness, the quality of not being covered with buildings or trees. Now that one's very important for an actor because years ago, um, I auditioned Forrest Whitaker. And I remember, I can't stand when an actor comes into the room with all those buildings and trees on them. And I, I just said to him, Forrest, I can't see you through the trees. Sorry. I love a good pun. I just love puns. When Richard Maltby and I get together behind the audition table, oh my God, pun city. Um, we have so much fun. Uh, we just love to play with words. Uh, anyway, I know it's cheap but I like it. Uh, a style of play characterized by action which is spread out over the field in sports. Openness, accessibility, frankness. Brene Brown says, we love seeing raw truth and openness in other people, but we're afraid to let them see it in us. We're afraid that our truth isn't enough, that what we have to offer isn't enough without the bells and whistles, without editing and impressing. Openness can be vulnerable. As a casting director, I can tell you that it's the most valuable thing. The thing we most hope to see in the audition room. Your vulnerability, your openness, your truth, your life experience. Uh, so valuable. I mean, think about it. What's the most common acting advice you get? Be yourself. Just be yourself. Just. Like it's such an easy thing to do. Be yourself. What's the most common advice you get about headshots? Make sure it looks like you. First, most important thing, it's got to look like you. There's the you thing that we're looking for. We're looking for you, yourself. As a casting director, I can tell you that is absolutely true. We want the most you-ness we can get from the audition experience. We want to understand who you are. Uh, why do we want all this you So apparently, um, I actually heard this only recently, that scientists have calculated now the odds of us manifesting here in this body, like you manifesting in that body that you're in right now, and myself manifesting in this one, they have calculated the odds with, with all of the transmission of sperm and egg and fertilization and all the things that could go wrong and all the ways it could not happen and the way finally that zygote is formed where, where a sperm and an egg, uh, a sperm fertilizes the egg and the zygote is there and that becomes this person that is you. The actual number the data shows is one in 400 trillion. So... When I say be yourself, when I say what I'm looking for is you, when we say your headshot needs to look like you, we want this you-ness in the audition experience. We want to understand more about you. We want to see what you bring to the role. What that is about is we are looking for a one in 400 trillion experience. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for you, unique 
invaluable one in 400 trillion you. That's what all that you be yourself is about. Be open to expressing yourself, your life experience, your vulnerability, your openness. It's about receiving. You know, in order to receive, we need to be open to receive. We, we need to be opening. It's more about the process. You know, when, um, when a flower is opening, that's the thing that's so beautiful. Um, we're, we're in the season, I think, for peonies, which are among my favorite flowers. They're so beautiful. When you see them and, and they're just new buds, they're so tight. They're like a fist. They're all like tight, tight, tightly wound. There's no, um, there's nothing indicating how beautiful they're going to become. They look like a tightly, tightly knotted little ball. And then they start opening. And when they open, there's like a zillion petals in there. It's so fantastic. It's like that. It's that opening. You know, when you, when you receive an arrangement from the florist, if all the flowers are already open, if they're all like, you know, about to die because they're fully open, you call the florist and you say, there's something wrong with this arrangement. Everything's opened already. I want the experience of them opening. I don't need them to be buds, but I need them to be in a process so I can experience that process of opening. So I can, I can know the moment of awakening and seeing that stargazer lily suddenly in full bloom and how glorious that is. I don't want to see it already bloomed. So the opening, the process, that's what's beautiful. Another great lesson there. It's not too late. If you're thinking, well, you know, where I am in my life, I'm, I'm not opening. I've opened. It's not too late. Maybe you'll open some new aspects of yourself. Maybe you'll discover some new things. Maybe there's more opening you've yet to do. I would venture to say to you, if you're still alive and you're still here, there's things to do. And there's something about, if you're wondering if you have any purpose in life, if you're wondering if, you're, if your work is done and you're finished with what you came here to do, well, if you're still alive, the answer to that last question is no. There's still something for you to do. So think about that. Emile Zola said that uh, happiness equals kindness, openness, and responsiveness together. I don't remember his exact phrasing, but the gist was that it's an equation. Kindness equals, um, uh, sorry, um, happiness equals kindness, openness, and responsiveness. I also think of uh, the, the famous politically incorrect character, Miss Swan from Mad TV, that uh, Alex Borstein played in the, um, the Asian nail salon owner, and, uh, and the sketch where Michael McDonald came to the, the nail salon and wanted to go in and she was just locking up and the sign said closed and she said no close and he's like oh you're closed well I, I wanted to try and she's like no close close very sad sad close and then she turned the sign around and went tomorrow open open happy open very happy close sad open happy so uh, Emil Zola and Miss Swan <laughs> in their very different ways we're basically saying the same thing. Openness can lead to happiness. Think of a place where you feel most open. For me, it's in the autumn, in a field, when I see piles of leaves and you can just jump in them, like a little kid. Or by the ocean, when I'm by the ocean and I see those waves and that, that infinite expanse, waves, sky, forever. It's so hard to not feel open by the water. Uh, what's your place? I don't know with this YouTube channel thing. Can we, can we write it in the comments? If you can, please do. I'd like to know. I'd like to know what's your open place. What's the place you go to either physically, geographically, or in your mind where you feel open? A friend of mine always reminds me of a prayer, she suggests. This or something better. You know, she always says when she's waiting on a job or thinking about a relationship with somebody, her prayer is always to offer it up to God and just say, this or something better, trusting that God may know better than we do. Uh, 
you know, uh, there's a really wonderful uh, video online that you can find very easily. Uh, it's Oprah, I think it's Oprah on Surrender or something like that. And it's about 10 minutes long. And uh, she's talking about her experience of going after the role in The Color Purple, how she uh, wanted that role so very much. And uh, she had auditioned for Steven Spielberg and she really was focused on it. She really wanted it. And how God's plan for her, uh, uh, God's plan for her apparently was the whole phenomenon that became the Oprah Winfrey show and Oprah and the Oprah Winfrey network. That that's what God's plan was. Her plan was for a role in a movie. And that's what she wanted. And that's what she kept praying for. But the importance of surrendering because sometimes... God or the universe, if you will, or your higher power or the power of community, however you like to think of it, uh, whatever it is that that is that cosmic goo that we all came from and that enables us with this 98% water and 2% dust to kind of meld together and get up and walk around and see and help one another and do things, that, that force, that energy, um, I call it God, you may call it something else. Uh, I often refer to it as the universe, you know, the power of the universe. Uh, but Oprah's uh, uh, suggestion is that God may have a better plan for you than anything you can even imagine. And that surrendering to that is the most valuable thing we can do for ourselves. That's openness, right? I mean, that's what it means to me. It doesn't mean that everything we open to is going to be a better experience. You know, we open to possibility and then life experiences occur. And sometimes they work out very well and sometimes less well. The important part is the opening, is exercising that ability we have to open. Openness is allowing. Openness is possibility. Openness is experience beyond ourselves, beyond ourselves as we currently understand or express or have manifested ourselves. Uh, something bigger, you know. Um, there's a, a mindset that's referred to as assumption. Um, I've heard it called many things. I've heard it called assumption. I've heard it called just simply mindset. I've heard it called the neural known. But the idea is that our mind takes what we know and processes it and experiences new things in the confines of what it already understands. Um, this has been studied and the mind actually does that. So it can work to our advantage. So for example, here's a really terrifying one um, that's from a New York Times Magazine article I read some time ago. Uh, the, because there's never been a nuclear attack on New York City, we assume there never will be. That is faulty logic. But that's what our mind does. And the reason we run back and forth to auditions and back and forth through Times Square and run back and forth to the theater all day long is because our mind takes comfort in knowing that that won't happen. And that's good because it keeps us sane, right? Uh, at the same time, it can work against us. So when you come into the audition room, if you've been on hundreds of auditions and you haven't booked anything lately, and your mind says to you at some point in that process, ah, yes, I remember what this is. This is that thing where we go in and we put our music on the piano and we sing for a little bit and we take our music and we leave and we don't get the job. Then you're coming in with an expectation of what you have previously experienced, which may not be the truth of what's about to happen. But you can make it happen that way by functioning within that limitation. If you let go of that, and you approach it with openness that here I am in this present moment, this person I've never been before. I was not this person a day ago, a week ago, a year ago, or even a moment ago because I've lived uh, another day, year, moment, whatever the experience of life is. And now I'm experiencing this song as the new person that I am and I'm open to what new experience this audition room may bring. This can be my thing. I'm open to it. That's a very different energy to bring into the room. That allows for a very different presentation of your talents and skills. So uh, you don't want to be limited by your assumption, by your neural known, by your mindset. You want to open your mindset. Uh, I've had so many great experiences with actors being open to 
accepting jobs to taking things to trying things out to going to Toronto for a year to do a job at a show to going on tour uh, we were most recently working on the heroin diaries when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic hit and the industry shut down for a little while it'll come back it's just shut down for the moment and um, and the show we were working on was uh, uh, Nikki Six's story of the Heroin Diaries, which is a song cycle as well as a book that he wrote. And it's a musical based on that, telling the story of heroin addiction. It's a very, very hard story to tell. Uh, it's got a lot of human suffering in it and a lot of human redemption. But these courageous actors willing to do what was necessary to tell that story, thrilling, moving, affecting, beautiful, powerful stuff. The openness of actors is something that I have been in awe of most of my life, certainly my whole professional life. Uh, I've done a good deal of work with Bill T. Jones, and he had a, um, uh, during Fela, uh, his last Broadway show, I, uh, I had the experience of going to rehearsals quite often. And I did that because I love him, and I love his work, and I love that show. And so every time there was some business to do, instead of calling up, I would always go by rehearsals as an excuse to sit and watch a little bit. And I happened to catch one day, there was one number where they, uh, the dancers went by and in the song, they actually call out for their crimes uh, in Africa, the, the WHO, the uh, uh, IMF, uh, BP, and all of these companies by their, their uh, acronyms. And the uh, dancers all had placards with those initials of those companies on them. And Bill had created something where they kind of came forward holding the placard downward and backwards. And as they came into the light, they would hold it upward and you could see it and bring it back down as they uh, uh, continued to circle out of the light so that the audience was seeing the signs coming up like that throughout. And one dancer said something to the effect of, um, well, I like my way better. And Bill was about to, you know, correct the choreography and explain what, what actually needs to be done. And he stopped himself. And he said, oh, okay, uh, show me your way. Let me see your way. And she showed herself, like, holding it way up as she came through from before to after in the pool of light. And Bill took that in, and then he explained, okay, the reason that won't work for this, as lovely as it is, is because um, with the arrangement of all of you and how you're crowding in to filter through, uh, the signs will hit one another and they will create noise and there's a danger of one of them getting knocked out of your hands. So for this, this will work better. And the thing that struck me so much about that was his openness. Bill T. Jones, not only a Kennedy Center honoree, but a National Medal of Arts recipient with that medal placed around his neck by President Obama. Bill T. Jones, as lauded and, and magnificent an artist as we have in this country, in this world, in a very truncated rehearsal process with very limited time, pausing what he was doing to embrace the openness of an idea that some dancer had and to look at it. Wow. We can be that open too. We can listen, hear, try, experience, be open, you know. Openness is a lot about trust. Openness is a lot about truth. It's a lot about a yes attitude. You know, saying yes opens us to experiences that allow us to move forward, to learn. Openness paves the way for learning. Merlin in The Once and Future King, he, uh, uh, The Once and Future King is the novel by T.H. White, uh, which Camelot, the musical, is based on. And, uh, uh, the character of Merlin, the wizard, when young King Arthur, uh, who's known as Wart in that part of the book when he's a kid, a uh, teenager, he says to Merlin that he's very depressed, and, and Merlin says to him, learn something. And Wart's like, what do you want me to learn? And he's like, it doesn't matter. I have found that the only real cure to bring us out of depression and that kind of deep sadness is to learn something. So go out and learn something. And then the wizard turns him into an ant or something, some other creature, or a hawk or something, and he learns new perspectives. Uh, I would add to that perhaps, be of service. That's another way to get ourselves out of feeling depressed or feeling stuck or feeling like, uh, you know, we're, we're, if, we, if we start to gravitate toward a negative place, uh, learn something or be of service. 
but let's be open. Let's be open to learning something. Let's be open to being of service to another. Uh, Rumi, the famous poet, he has a, 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 a quote from a poem that's so beautiful. Uh, Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. So the, the judgment-free zone, the beginner's mindset, that's a big place where openness happens. That's a big place that openness brings to us and makes possible. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. Children are open. They do the most fantastical things. They run around the beach naked and jump in the water. Don't give a thought to closing off. Albert Einstein said, genius is not that you are smarter than everyone else. It's that you are ready to receive the inspiration. So openness was the secret to his genius as well. Open to the idea that all things are possible. If the universe does have a plan for us, who are we to think we know better? The Course in Miracles says, to accept your littleness is arrogant because it means that you believe that your evaluation of yourself is truer than God's. We have some time now. Let's open ourselves up like in The Wizard of Oz. Open, ah, open, ah. Open, 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 ah. This is Arnold Manjoli for Grateful, Ready, Open, Willing. Thanks for joining me for a little while today. We'll see you again.